Every time I see the title or this talk, I just get a chill up my spine because these are some of the scariest patients that you can see in the emergency department. But good thing we have Emily here to demystify things and make it a lot easier so that the next time you see this patient, you know what to do. Please welcome her back. All right. So what I'm going to discuss today is an algorithm that I wish I had on a patient that I'm going to present to you I encountered in fellowship, which really is an algorithm that, that should direct your approach to any tracheostomy patient with respiratory distress. So this was that patient, and this is actually a picture, HIPAA compliant, of him. He was 44. He overdosed on heroin in Camden. Uh, and actually came into the ED in PEA arrest. And he had sort of a prolonged resuscitation. And ultimately, I encountered in him in the ICU during my fellowship. Um, and he suffered severe anoxic brain injury. And he was young. His mother really struggled with the decision for tracheostomy, but ultimately elected to perform that. And so now I'm presenting this patient to you. Coming, I saw him in our step-down unit nine days out from trach, but you can imagine him in your emergency department or elsewhere in the hospital. So he's tachycardic, he's tachypnic, he's in severe respiratory distress. So he's using accessory muscles, um, is hypertensive. And throughout this talk, I want you to sort of think of a patient like this or this patient and how you would approach them in sort of a systematic fashion. We do a whole lot of tracheostomies in the United States, 110,000 annually. That's more than our European counterparts. 40 to 50% of tracheostomy patients will have a complication. Most of these are in the ICU, sort of after placement, and many of them are minor and require sort of minimal intervention. But 1% of, of tracheostomy patients will suffer a catastrophic airway complication. And half of airway deaths that occur in the ED or the ICU are due to dislodgement or decannulation. I want to spend a moment on the actual trach itself because I will tell you that I didn't manage a lot of trachs in my residency and so exposure to these in fellowship and getting familiar with the equipment was really crucial to sort of uh, relaxing my approach to these patients. So I do want to go over the parts of a trach. So you've got the outer cannula, the inner cannula, and the obturator. Unlike an endotracheal tube, the outer cannula of a trach is very rigid. Uh, and so it keeps its form, unlike a, a tr an ET tube that you need to put in a stylet with. Here, this neck plate here that sits on the neck of the patient, when you look at your patient, the upper right-hand corner will give you most of the information you need to know about sizing. So typically, four, six, eight, these round numbers are the inner diameter size. So that's the functional inner diameter with that inner cannula in place. And so when we call it a size six shyly, we're referring to that inner diameter. You can look at this and know, even if you can't see in the back this translucent balloon, you can glance at the screen and know this is a cuff tracheostomy tube because there's a pilot balloon. So similarly, when you encounter your patient, one of the first things you should look at, it should take one second, is there a pilot balloon? Why? Because we need an inflated cuff to ventilate them with positive pressure with either a bag valve mask or a mechanical ventilator. The inner cannula is equally important. So the inner cannula, and again, another thing I didn't know, must be inserted into the outer cannula in order to connect a bag valve mask or a mechanical ventilator. So I've had patients come into the ED, they've taken out their inner cannula, you can't actually bag them without that inner cannula in place. Why the inner cannula? It's a foreign body in the airway, right? So it, it sort of generates mucus. These things commonly get gunked up with secretions. And so we'll talk about the algorithm. This is a quick way to remove that inner cannula, suction the patient, clean it out, and maintain patency. The obturator is probably not what you think the purpose is. So unlike a stylet for an ET tube, again, this is a rigid structure. In fact, so much so, uh, when I give this talk at a residency, if I hand around a trach, you can feel the distal end of that trach tube. It's sort of rigid and uh, sharp on your finger. The posterior wall of the trachea is a completely membranous structure. There's only one cartilaginous, circumferential cartilaginous structure in the neck, and that's the cricoid cartilage. So when we're inserting a trach, if that sharp edge goes against the membranous wall of the trachea, you can cause a TE fistula. So the purpose of this is actually to blunt, is to protrude out the end of the outer cannula and sort of blunt that insertion uh, into the patient. This is just to show you and remind you that, again, you need a cuff tube in order to ventilate your patient without a leak. These are some brands you might encounter. I don't have any disclosures. We have a lot of Shiley's and Bavona's at where I work. Uh, a metal Jackson you might see with uh, uh, 
laryngectomy patient, these don't have a cuff, you might encounter sort of a simple uncuffed Shiley or a, even a fenestrated which has more holes in it. The purpose of this is so uh, the air can actually go up through the cord. So as a patient uh, comes off the ventilator and they want to be able to speak, they can't have a cuff inflated or else no air will go up through the cords. You might encounter some of these one-way speaking valves. These are one-way inspiratory valves. If you have a patient in distress, yank this valve off of there, no air can go out when you have a valve on it like that. So always, always, if you have a patient in respiratory failure and you're going to ventilate them, they need a cuff. So what do you need to know? These are four pieces of information. The first two are essential. Um, the, the last two are, are less essential. So this is what I was talking about when you're looking at your patient. 6-DCT just stands for disposable cannula tube, meaning that inner cannula is not reusable. You're supposed to throw it away and use a new one. This is the size. Six. Uh, is the size. Again, you can glance at this, and I know this is a cuff tube because I can see that pilot balloon. You can actually see um, the cuff in this picture. You can just glance at the chest of your patient and know whether you have a cuff or not. The reason for trach would be nice to know, right? So if they're, both their vocal cords are paralyzed or there's a large subglottic mass, if you're troubleshooting the trach and may need to put in a new airway, that would be nice to know. And then finally, the date of placement. The date of placement is important to know uh, and less common than the ED that you would encounter prior to this time period, but a stoma is simply a tracheocutaneous fistula. And so if the stoma has not yet had time to heal at 7 to 10 days, that increases the risk if you're putting in a new tube that you could cause a false passage. A false passage is when you make it into the cutaneous hole, but not into the, the trachea, and instead pass it in the subcutaneous tissue. What happens if you bag someone or mechanically vent them under positive pressure if you have passed it into a false passage? Massive sub-Q emphysema. This is, a, this is a case report from chest, although this is not case reportable anymore. This happens not infrequently. This is all, this patient is not morbidly obese. This is all sub-Q emphysema. If you look at his x-ray, it extends all the way down his thorax. He has bilateral tension pneumothoraces. So when you're encountering resistance with bagging, just be very careful about creating this scenario because not only would it be difficult to intubate this patient oral tracheally because they'd be so hypoxemic, it would be nearly impossible to reinsert a trach tube. So what is the algorithm? So I'm going to just be honest with you. When I encountered that patient, I felt relatively lost. I essentially stumbled upon what was wrong with him, but didn't feel that I had an organized approach to the tracheostomy patient in respiratory distress. So that's what I'm going to discuss today. This, uh, it got cut off on this screen, but this is published in Anesthesia by McGrath. So the first thing is, we're going to go through our ABCs, right? So apply oxygen. If they have inadequate respiratory effort, then we're going to want to do positive pressure. The default action for all trach patients in respiratory distress should be both to bag the face as well as the neck. The reason for that is we don't know if there is an obstruction or where it is. So that's why the default action is always oxygen to the face, either high flow if they're breathing or positive pressure if they're not. How would you bag... Uh, if you didn't have the trach there and they dislodged it, how would you bag the stoma? Two options. If you're in the ED, you may have access to a pediatric bag valve mass. You can establish a seal and bag the stoma. Second option is you should have this anywhere, an LMA. So if you inflate like a size 4 or 5 LMA, you can create a seal, a seal around that stoma. All right. So remember our guy. He's come in. He's in respiratory distress. We're bagging both his trach tube as well as his, his face. And the next step is then to remove that inner cannula. Remember, a common thing being it's gunked up with secretions, so we pull it out, clean it out, and either put a backup one in or, or put the same one back if once it's clean. The next step is both diagnostic and therapeutic. You insert that uh, sterile inline suction catheter. The reason it's diagnostic is if you can only insert it a couple one centimeter, two centimeters, your trach tube is either dislodged or it's obstructed. Um, if, in fact, you can, you can insert it all the way, you can potentially suction out the airway and clear it out. But if you do that and your patient is not better, the next step is to deflate the cuff. And you might be thinking, wait a minute, why would I want to do that if I need to bag them with an inflated cuff for a closed system? The, re the reason is you may have what's a partially displaced trach tube that if it pulls out a little, now the balloon is inflated and completely occluding the trachea. So in this step, we deflate it, we insert it and now reinflate it and see if our patient's better. If they're no better, the next step is actually to remove that trach tube. And I can tell you that I feel uncomfortable doing this, right? We think of this as a definitive surgical airway. But my counter to you would be in the face of a decompensating trach patient, 
that has a, either a dislodged or obstructed airway, that trach tube is of no benefit to you and it's actually of harm to your patient. So now we've removed our trach tube, sorry, and we're in emergency oxygenation mode. We're bagging both the, the nose and mouth as well as the stoma, and now we need to intubate. In the green algorithm patient, you have two choices. You can either orotracheally intubate or intubate the stoma with either an ET tube or a trach tube. Um, and so that's why really in all cases when a trach patient comes in, no matter how stable they are, get a backup trach to the bedside. Um, and so if we decide, hey, I'm most comfortable with oral tracheal intubation, I'm going to intubate from above, you simply pass the tube as you normally would, the cuff is below the level of the stoma, and then you can cover it with like Vaseline gauze or something. Understand though, the next call once they're stabilized should be to the physician who placed it, whether that's ENT, trauma, or interventional pulmonary, because even with a mature stoma, this closes by 50% in the first 12 hours and 90% within the first 24 hours. So you really have a short window of time where the surgeon or interventionalist is gonna be able to reinsert that trach tube, otherwise they have to sort of redo the trach down the line. Let's talk about, so really there is one algorithm, and I just presented it to you, but there is one scenario where that algorithm, we need to change the last step, and that's the laryngectomy patient. So we all know the anatomy of someone who's not had a laryngectomy. You and I, our mouth ends in two holes, the esophagus or the trachea. Once a patient has had a laryngectomy, their larynx has been removed and the distal portion of their trachea has been permanently surgically pulled through uh, to the skin surface to form a stoma. So the mouth ends in the esophagus. I don't care how good your airway skills are, you cannot intubate through the mouth a laryngectomy patient. You will be ventilating the stomach 100% of the time. So this is why we need to think of the laryngectomy patient as an obligate neck breather, right? So they're an obligate stomal breather. Um, now you might say, well, why is the default action in the laryngectomy patient? Why do we need to oxygenate the nose and the mouth? You don't necessarily. In fact, if you knew they'd had a laryngectomy, you wouldn't have to do that step. That's all going in the stomach. The problem is laryngectomy patients are only three to 5% of patients. And so in all the other patients, it's important that we do that step. All right, so let's think back to our algorithm. In the interest of time, I'm gonna tell you the algorithm is exactly the same, right? So we're, uh, you might be able to not do the face step, but we're, we're ventilating via the stoma or the trach tube. We get to the end of the algorithm and they're still not better. At this point, we have positive pressure, bag valve mask ventilation on either the stoma with an LMA or a bag valve mask, and now we need to intubate. But we've only got one choice, one hole, and that's the stoma. You can either use uh, a trach tube, and this is what I prefer. I think it's easier, it's rigid, it goes in better. Um, you can also use a 6.0 or 6.5 ET tube. Just remember that you only want to insert it until you just lose sight of that cuff. It's very easy to right main stem someone when you're inserting an ET tube. It's only about four or five centimeters from the carina. And this is why we have a backup trach at the bedside of all our tracheostomy patients. All right, so let's go back to this patient that I encountered in our step down unit. He's in severe respiratory distress, he's hypoxic, and now let's think about it systematically. What are we gonna do first? Anybody? I think you said apply oxygen to both positive pressure now, we're bagging both the face and the trach tube. And he, you know, you get his sats up a little bit, high 80s, but he's still not improving. So next step, we're removing that inner cannula, right? So cleaning that out, and the next step after that Suction, the inline suction. In this case, we're able to pass that suction catheter all the way in, pull it out, there's really no secretion. So that's not the problem. He's still not better. So what's our next step? Very good. So we deflate that cuff, reposition, reinflate the cuff obviously, and we're bagging him again. Still not better. Next step? We need a new trach tube. So either you, at this point you can intubate him, you're doing emergency oxygenation, you can intubate him orally or via stoma. In this case I chose to put a tracheostomy tube, a new one, uh, via stoma and he improved. And you may think, well what was the problem? And I will tell you that if you use that algorithm, you may not figure it out, but you will have fixed your patient. Do you mind playing this? Uh, is it possible? So these are, and if you attend our ventilator station later, I know we talked about graphics. So here you've got pressure flow and volume. Does anyone see a problem who maybe was at our station yesterday? What? 
the volume tracing, very good. So we have our inspiratory limb of the volume tracing and expiratory limb. We got this cutoff, right? It means the ventilator's not getting back that full return volume. You can actually quantify it. He's losing half his tidal volume. So this is a leak. Uh, this is what you call a cuff rupture. I have two daughters. This is not my daughter, but I will tell you this is the universal childhood response to a broken balloon. Um, and so in this case, uh, I stumbled upon the fact that this patient had ruptured his cuff, but I didn't really have an algorithmic approach to it. So just to recap, I want you to think about this algorithm. Relax, you do resuscitation. A trach patient is simply a patient with two airways, um, unless they've had a laryngectomy. Approach all trach complications like a difficult intubation. Remember the steps of the algorithm. And then always have a backup trach at the bedside, a cuffed backup trach, um, because you're going to need a cuff inflated for mechanical ventilation. And I'm happy to take any questions.